We covered the 1957 Priscilla test a few weeks ago. American nuclear tests often had quite meaningless names like George, Dog, Easy, Diablo, Saturn. But the rumour persists that Priscilla was named after a notorious local prostitute. If so, well, Priscilla must have been quite um, memorable to get a nuke named after her. The book A Nuclear Family Vacation says of Priscilla that she was a thing of beauty, an incandescent cloud, a perfectly formed column of red dust ringed with a halo of fire rose above the Nevada desert. It was seductive, terrible and beautiful. A nuclear money shot. Well, if the rumour about Priscilla's name is true, then this is just one example of nuclear bombs. Their power and display and awesomeness and, yeah, their sheer showmanship being linked to sex. So let's look at some of the other examples going back to 1946, in the early days of the nuclear age. In the 1940s, of course, we had fabric rationing. And so clothes generally became prim and plain, with no spare fabric for froth and folds and sweeps and swirls. And that is why in Paris in 1947, once the war was over, Christine Dior launched his famous collection called The New Look, which rebelled against all the enforced wartime simplicity. The new look was glamorous and feminine, and the skirts were full and swishy. But there was one aspect of French fashion which took the opposite approach. Forget full fabric and length and volume. The fashion designer Jacques Heim created a two-piece swimming costume called the Atom, named for the smallest particle in the universe. But across Paris... Another guy was watching, and he thought, Ha! You call that a skimpy swimsuit? The Atom had what now looks like a generous pair of granny knickers on the bottom. They were high-waisted, and they reached up to cover the belly button and the hips. Nuts to that, thought Louis Riard, and he invented his own skimpy swimsuit cutting the bottoms so that they were even slinkier and skimpier and inching the waistband down to reveal the woman's hips and, shocking, her navel. This was, of course, the bikini. A bathing suit could qualify as a bikini, said Riard, only if it was so thin and flimsy that it could be pulled through a wedding ring and he was able to package the tiny 30 square inches of fabric required inside a matchbox. Of course, it was shocking and controversial. He couldn't even find a swimsuit model who would parade the thing for him. He had to resort to a nude dancer from one of the Parisian nightclubs. So this appalling, horrifying, eye-watering, immoral display... Could have only one name, the Bikini. And that, of course, was named after Bikini Atoll, where, just a few days before, the US had begun nuclear tests. The 1946 nuclear test at Bikini 
were notable as they were the world's first nuclear explosions since the war, since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So they were the first to be done in peacetime. So here was peace at last, 1946. Solemn, quiet, respectable peace. And into the midst of all comes sashaying the shock of more nuclear explosions. Yes, I think we can see why Monsieur Riard called his controversial, shocking swimsuit the bikini. Now, 1946, peace has arrived and arguably the Cold War hasn't yet begun. So what was the purpose of the bikini tests? There was no war to fight any longer. Well, an official reason had to be given, so that was, we want to see the effect of nuclear explosions on ships. A collection of about... 80 redundant ships were brought out to Bikini and they were scattered across the water, left to float there quietly and wait for the bombs to begin. The guy in charge of the whole show, which was called Operation Crossroads, was named Admiral Blandy and he famously made a speech insisting that these tests would be perfectly safe and primly declaring to the media I am not an atomic playboy. Let's listen to his speech. The bomb will not start a chain reaction in the water, converting it all to gas and letting all the ships on all the oceans drop down to the bottom. It will not blow out the bottom of the sea and let all the water run down the hole. It will not destroy gravity. I am not an atomic playboy, as one of my critics labeled me, exploding these bombs to satisfy my personal whim. The first explosion from the Operation Crossroads at Bikini was called Abel, and that was dropped from the air, whereas the second test, Baker, was an underwater test. Now, these tests weren't secretive. If you look back to the very first nuclear test, Trinity, That was, of course, highly secret because it was wartime. But we're now in 1946, there is peace, and the Americans wanted the world to know what awesome power they had going on. So they happily invited the press to observe. So we had a shocking display by the beach in front of a bunch of goggle-eyed men. That's a bikini for you. Of the two tests, Baker was the most impressive. If you can, seek out the documentary Trinity and Beyond and you'll see footage of the Baker explosion rearing up from the water like some kind of sea monster. It instantly begins to form a mushroom but the stem of the mushroom, instead of being smoky, looks spiky and hairy and choppy as it's dragging so much seawater up with it. It's a mushroom made of radioactive steam and spray. When we see clouds from atmospheric tests, they often seem dreamlike, distant and smoky and tinged with colour. But this monster, composed of seawater, looks harsh and salty. Seen from above, the shockwave runs out across the blue sea in a perfect ring of lurid white, rushing towards and engulfing all the ships who are patiently sitting on the sea like little toy boats. More shots from above show the blue sea with this massive churning foam monster on it. And then, rising up from the centre of the monster, comes a dirty-looking pink-brown mushroom cloud, coloured that way by the pulverised coral of the lagoon. Now, remarkably, a lot of the ships actually remained afloat. Uh, Most of them did, although they were, of course, severely damaged. A reminder then that even though this bomb was a whopper, it was just an atomic bomb. We were not yet in the properly horrific thermonuclear age. Here's a short clip from Trinity and Beyond. Bikini Baker was an underwater burst of the same device, and it produced much more damage 
to the Armada of 70 ships. For instance, the USS Saratoga had the bottom of it essentially knocked out of it from the underwater burst. And the Saratoga sank and sets upright in the bottom of the Bikini Lagoon at the present time. I've often flown over Bikini Lagoon, and on clear days when the water is quiet, you can still see the Saratoga setting there. So that was the big Baker test. It was part of Operation Crossroads, which was originally supposed to have had three tests, an A, a B and a C, Abel, Baker and then Charlie. But Charlie was postponed once Baker shook everyone up slightly. But what about Abel, the first one? He wasn't as spectacular as he should have been because he missed his target. Abel was, as we mentioned, dropped from a plane and his target, the USS Nevada, was missed. This was despite the USS Nevada being painted in bright orange as a visual aid. Now, like Baker, the target ship and most of the others didn't sink. Nonetheless, an assessment of Abel by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists said that the crew of these ships, had they been manned, would have died. And yes, as horrible as it is to contemplate, there were animals tethered to the ships, and many of them died either instantly or days later from radiation sickness. So whilst Abel might not have given the spectacular visual display of sinking or pulverising ships, it would still have killed any enemy crew in war. The bulletin said, quote, a large ship, about a mile away from the explosion, would escape sinking, but the crew would be killed by the deadly burst of radiations from the bomb, and only a ghost ship would remain, floating unattended in the vast waters of the ocean. So that was our ABLE test, the first test after the war, the first test in the era of peace, peace in inverted commas. And even though Abel was a bit of a disappointment, it too has a connection to sex. The magnificent Rita Hayworth was starring in her latest film, Gilda, when the bikini tests began. As the crew were loading the Abel bomb into the plane, they decided to give it a nickname. We've all heard of bombs being nicknamed, what about Fat Man and Little Boy? Well, this particular bomb was nicknamed Gilda. And they also painted a portrait of the famous love goddess on the side of the bomb. Yep, Rita Hayworth was a bombshell. Here's a quote from a local newspaper at the time. For this was a sort of token pin-up to indicate to all of the women of the world that their charm was even more devastating than that of atomic science. The stout hearts of men wear true frail in armour to withstand the charm of womanhood. <laughs> the article goes on. Is it a sharing of the sublime? or a descent into the ridiculous, that the face of Rita Hayworth should be emblazoned upon the weapon that killed the pigs of Bikini. One doesn't need to labour the point, but the reflective man or woman may wish, sometimes, that feminine beauty would prove equally as inspiring to the peacemakers as to the warriors. I got that quote from the brilliant Cold War website, Connell Rad, who have a huge article about the Rita Hayworth story. Indeed, they asked a few years ago whether it was true or too good to be true. They questioned archivists, scrutinised photos and footage of the Abel bomb and spoke to crewmen who were there. There was confusion and conflicting stories. Some said a painting of Hayworth was done on the bomb. Others said a poster had just been slapped onto the side. Some said there was no likeness of Hayworth, just a stencil of the film title Gilda. 
So with all these differing stories and no actual evidence of the love goddess on the bombshell, could it be true? And then, a few years later, Conrad announced they had cracked the case. They had found an actual image of Rita on the bomb. It was true, after all. So seek out conorad.blogspot.com, one of my favourite websites, one of my favourite Twitter accounts, and you'll read all about it and see the images of Hayworth on the bomb. You'll see the film title Gilda was indeed stenciled onto the bomb in heavy black script. And there's a portrait of Rita just below it, her long hair cascading over her shoulders and her bust being held in just by a strapless black evening gown. Here's a clip of her husband, Orson Welles, talking about Rita Hayworth on the A-bomb. I don't know what this means, or even if it has meaning, but I can't resist mention of the fact that this much can be revealed concerning the appearance of tonight's atom bomb. It will be decorated with a photograph, a sizable likeness, of a young lady named Rita Hayworth. Not long ago, I watched quite another sort of young lady paint her lips with something called, over the counter, the atom lipstick. The case of the cosmetic being fashioned according to the popular conceptions of the original war engine. I'm sure you won't need to be told that Miss Hayworth is not one to use such a thing or to hold it as anything less than a very hideous conceit. Her face is not on the atom bomb then by her own choosing, but by election of the flyers who will drop the bomb and who are clearly the business according to their tastes. As regards selection, I find their taste beyond reproach, but the bomb dropping itself had better be worthy of the accompanying photograph. He talks there of atomic lipstick. Vegas, cashing in on the new atomic tourism of the 50s, began offering guests atomic cocktails, which they could enjoy at the Sky Room in the famous Desert Inn, which boasted high and clear views of the Nevada test site. Sip your atomic cocktail and... Watch the mushroom clouds peep over the horizon. So we had atomic lipstick and atomic cocktails in the flashy atomic city of Vegas. In the 50s, before we knew about the real horror of lethal fallout, everything was atomic, especially if it was glamorous or futuristic, or if the business wanted to peddle it to you as such. One of the most famous examples of Las Vegas's fusing of sex with the atomic bomb was the various beauty pageants held in the city where women in swimsuits were crowned Miss Atomic Bomb or Miss A-Bomb or Miss Atomic Blast. If we want to get all deep and symbolic, we might consider that one contest crowned a local beauty as Miss Q. The name came from Operation Q, which was a series of nuclear tests designed to see how ordinary structures would stand up to nuclear blast. Out on the test site, replicas of ordinary suburban homes were built, and within them were placed mannequins, showing Mom and Pop and Junior living normal family life. Often they'd be living it by the window, so we could later test how flying glass might slice them up. These domestic family scenes are the opposite of what the slinky beauty queen represents. Such a woman is often described as a homewrecker, which is exactly what the bomb was doing in these tests. So they declared a local glamour puss to be Miss Q, and the humour in the name comes from the fact that Q was delayed several times due to bad weather. It was constantly Miss Q'd. We got a whole lot of new listeners this week, so let me say hello and welcome. My name is Julie McDowell, and you can find me on Twitter at Julie A. McDowell, on Facebook under Nuclear Britain, or on my website, juliemcdowell.com. And if you enjoy the podcast, please consider supporting me with a donation each month via Patreon. Go to my page on patreon.com forward slash Atomic Hobo. My newest patron is Martin Edwards, who joined yesterday, and also Liz Rivard. Thank you to both. Your nuclear rewards will soon be in the post. So thank you everyone else for listening and I will be back next Monday with another episode.